um, today we've got Matthew Langridge uh, from Rio Tinto here. Um, he's going to talk about digital and how it's implemented in the mining industry at the at the current state and from from his perspective. And I think he has a has a brilliant perspective on it. I think he has 21 years of experience in the in the mining industry and 21 years of experience in the mining industry and all of those years with Rio Tinto. So he's probably one of the the most knowledgeable people um, within that organization. So it's great, great to have you here, Matt, and have you present on, on your thoughts and ideas around the, the topic. And we're gonna keep it pretty uh, uh, interactive, I hope so. Matt is gonna present, and then uh, if you guys have questions, it would be awesome if you could throw them in the chat. Um, it is also possible to use the raise hand function and then we try to um, work that off, but it's easiest if you just put your question in the chat. And if you would really like to ask a question yourself, you can also put that in there and we can, do that, but um, I think for the most part, it's going to be easier to just throw it in there. Um, we just got a poll up to give uh, Matt and um, all the attendees kind of an idea of who's in the room and uh, just some basic questions. Also good for us to know who's actually uh, liking these, those talks. And yeah, with that, uh, thanks again, Matt. I think you're going to do a brief entry yourself. Um, again, really appreciate uh, you taking the time. I know you're super busy, so it's great to have you here in this virtual format and hopefully maybe we do a the second round sometime in, in person in the future. Thanks. Thanks so much. And hopefully the sharing works now. Ah, perfect. Whew. All right. Thank you, Lucas. That's quite the introduction. Uh, it is absolutely my pleasure to be here. So thank you so much for inviting me, Lucas. Uh, really excited to give this presentation today. As I was actually going through rehearsing the presentation and thinking about it, I was sort of struck by the irony of starting a digital presentation by trying to figure out how to put up PowerPoint slides, right? A, a tool that we've been using for multi decades now. And I was reflecting on that and thinking, well, why, why are we still using PowerPoint? Why, why is that the first thing that I'm going to do is look to, to provide you with some PowerPoint slides. And I think it's actually instructive for our conversation today. Hopefully by the end of this presentation, what you've sort of gathered is two perspectives. One is what it actually looks like from the inside and a, and a practitioner's view of how digital is changing mining and some of the trends we see that are driving that. But the other is maybe some perspective on what that might mean to a mining engineer and how we're going to move, uh, what, what a career in mining might look like and perhaps a different view of what a career in mining might look like as I explore my own history. And so we use PowerPoint, but the question is sort of, well, why? Well, to communicate all those messages, we want to be able to provide some visual medium. We want to be able to provide some words on the screen so you can actually digest the concepts. At the same time, I want to be able to talk to those things. And the reality is, is that what PowerPoint gives us is a brilliant platform that actually meets exactly the needs of what we're trying to, to do here today, we're trying to exchange some information, collaborate on ideas, and PowerPoint's actually a great tool for us to do that. And I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this presentation and think about the themes of digital in mining, because it's really a story about how digital is impacting people, the way in which tools and business processes interconnect, uh, and the way we can change people's experience in working in the technical fields of mining. I just have to remember how to advance the slide. So this gives me an opportunity to throw up some really nice pictures from my career, except for the one in the middle, uh, and talk to myself and 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 talk about myself, which is for those that know me, and there are a few hecklers on the call as, as a topic I'm never afraid of. But Look, the, the point here is to give you a little bit of a history of mine. So I graduated from mines in 2000 uh, with a bachelor's of science in, in mining engineering. And I went to work for a small coal mine in Northwest Colorado. It was a great experience to start with, a classic sort of start to a mining engineering, uh, mining engineering career. I started off as a truck shovel planner, uh, building out you know, the sequence of truck shovel activities in a complex multi-seam coal mine. Worked underneath the the senior engineer, uh, then eventually did some operations leadership roles, spent some time in maintenance leadership, back in operations leadership. 
after six years, I left call a while. Uh, I spent time at the WEPA operations in far north Queensland, Australia. WEPA is a completely different operation, tabular deposit, you know, maximum of sort of 20 feet deep. And I learned a lot living in a remote location about the integration of a mining asset and the host economy. I learned a lot about how people experience mining in remote communities. I learned about the impact uh, on Aboriginal communities. And I learned actually a lot about the technical aspects of rehabilitation uh, in the mine planning uh, in the mine planning and environment manager role. I left WEPA after three and a half years. We moved back to Salt Lake City with our family. Uh, and I spent five and a half years at the Bingham Canyon mine, which is actually pictured up in the left-hand corner. Now, you know, this, this is sort of a fantastic career experience. Um, not that all mining isn't interesting, but you'd have to think of being in large open pit copper mining as miners mining. Like this is really technically complex. You're talking about the largest freestanding high wall in the world, one of the biggest open pit excavations on earth. You're constantly chasing that next ton, that next piece of productivity in a declining grade strategy. And it was, it was a truly wonderful experience that was, that was definitely marked by the main phase slide. Some of you may recall from 2012, where we had the largest landslide in mining history. But for sure, it was also a story about people in that what amazing people can accomplish if they're united behind a common goal and you can build out high performing teams. So I left Kennecott Bingham Canyon after five and a half years and I moved over back overseas to Western Australia where I spent two years in our iron ore business uh, and I worked in the operations center. So the operations center in Perth for so, some of you may know is, is a facility that runs in Perth the operations about 2000 kilometers north in the Pilbara region of Western Australia. So we operate 15 mines, uh, 1700 kilometers of rail network, four independent ports, all from a facility in Perth, Western Australia. And so spent two years, you're moving a million tons a day and you're trying to do this through a complex value chain to meet stringent grade requirements for the seaborne iron ore trade. And after that, my career took a pretty a pretty different turn. It took a, a, a hard right-hand turn where I started spending more time in the digital space in data and analytics for the last three and a half years. And I think the connecting thread here, if you look all the way back in the story here, is that is, is two really important points. One is the fantastic experience that mining has given me over a 20 year career to live in some amazing places, get to work with unbelievable people. Uh, and work on some really, really challenging problems. But the second is also that if you went back and looked at how we're doing truck shovel planning today, it doesn't actually look that much different than what we were doing 20 years ago. We're still using the same basic process and the same tools we were from 20 years ago, despite all the advancements that we've made. And as I reflect on the time, particularly coming out of the OC, the impact of that is what you see across all of these different mining regions around the world is that some of our most talented people in mining in engineering roles, reliability roles, in analysts, planners, schedulers, they're all frustrated with tools that don't meet the business process, with friction caused by digital technologies, with lack of access to data, and it continues to be something that is incredibly frustrating to them in their Digital doesn't just give us the opportunity to transform the mining industry. It gives us the opportunity to make a massive impact on people's lives in the way they experience their work. And I think that's the most important and compelling part of this story. If we sort of dive into the topic, there's no doubt that what we're seeing is that technologies are making a massive difference. We all see the stories, right? Whether it's com computer games playing complex games, or whether it's about how the medical industry is using analytics, image analytics to outperform doctors in the ability to identify disease, or whether it's about financial industry, banking institutions identifying corruption or insurance in companies using analytics to process claims. And we're seeing that more and more move into our personal lives. And here I think a couple of stories are instructive just to give a sense of how it's really changing us even, even as we don't, even as we progress through just our daily lives. 
we, my wife and I have probably spent way too much time looking at Instapots. For those that don't know, these are really just a more complex version of what my mother used to use as a pressure cooker. Um, and it's the equivalent of putting a high pressure vessel on your kitchen counter and walking away. Um, we didn't for years, we sort of looked at these things and said no, but what changed it uh, was me working from home due to COVID and forgetting to constantly turn on the crock pot. And the fact that you can now buy Instapots that are connected to the internet. They have an IP endpoint and you can control them anywhere in the world with your phone. And so this experience of how we relate to technology and to endpoint devices is, is actually invading us. So now we have an Instapot uh, where my wife can make absolutely certain that I've started dinner. So beyond that, we've also put in an Alexa device in the house. And I think perhaps this is even more important. Now, the truth is, is that we put in an Alexa device in the house about two years ago and we hardly ever use it. It's little more than a sophisticated music player. But what's really fascinating is that when, we, when the four people in my home all come up against a question that we don't know, my wife, my 18-year-old daughter, and myself all grab for our phone. But my 12-year-old turns and asks Alexa. And he is already changing his expectation of how he expects to interact with technology. I also think he does it because it's the one thing that listens better than his sister and he can tell it what to do and it can't say no. So we know that things are changing, well, why? So these themes are, are you, you know, you'd be well familiar with these themes. You've sat, through, you've sat through plenty of presentations that deal with these, that, that deal with these, that deal with these themes. There, none of this is particularly new. We know that. The math, uh, the math around machine learning, artificial intelligence, it's been around since the 1950s. But what we're now seeing is massive data growth, the low cost storage and compute and new software stacks. And these are important. What we're actually seeing and I think this is really instructive to how we approach digital in our industry, is an approach that very much marries waiting to put the sidewalks in until you see where people are walking through the grass. So if you look at how AWS is trying to reduce the barriers to entry for people, they've seen how people are using their compute service to constantly build forecasting models, and then they developed a service to help you build the best forecasting model faster. So the real question that confronts us is, how do we start to create this reality in our industry? So we know that we're going to continue to see this expand as we go forward. We know that more and more devices, much like my Instapot, are going to be continued to connect, uh, connect in and provide us data. We know that we're gonna have more people on the planet and we know we're gonna see more and more businesses developing. But what's really changing everything is the rise of platforms. And I think this is where we turn into what we can start to think of as the experience in mining. If I look back just even, even in the short 20 year career that I've had, we look at how technology and IT has changed just in the time that I've been in the industry. When I arrived, you went to the IT person and they provided you a desktop computer. Keep in mind, this was a time where you actually had to provide a justification as to why you needed a laptop to work away from the mine site. So you, that was what technology was, was simply the provision of a desktop computer. We moved into a period where you can really think about it as full service. You could get whatever you wanted for technology as long as it was on the menu. Standardization was key. But now what we're seeing is actually that we're providing what platform providers are looking to do for us is make it so that you can get whatever you want and build it yourself at home. And that's fundamentally changing how we're interacting with that rise of data, with that low cost computing and with the analytics. We see this, this sort of idea of technology available to everyone. I think most compelling in, in, if you look at the Netflix, the Instagram and the YouTube story. What that's really done, the real amazing thing about that is it's completely changed it to where everyone is now a content producer. It's no longer just a specialized few, 
It's no longer owned by just one person in the industry. The reality is anyone with a mobile phone and a camera can become a content producer and share with millions. So let's bring this together to how we think about mining digital and the digital and mining in the digital and mining com uh, combination. What's amazing to me is that it has been, you know, go back to my example of sort of, we're not really doing short-term planning different than we were 20 years ago. This is despite the fact that, as you know, Caterpillar unveiled the first automated machine in 1996 at Mine Expo. We've seen that advance to drills, we've seen it advance to water carts, motor graders, and in our, in our business, even in trains. And yet, we're still struggling to get a planning process at nearly any mining operation to not be entirely based on Excel. Now, I don't happen to be in the camp of hating Excel. I think it's an amazing platform that's probably one of the best prototyping tools that we've ever seen, but that's not actually how we're using it. We're using it very differently than that, and it creates amazing friction in our business. What's interesting about mining is I reflect as I reflect on all the operations that we've been at, is what we do exceptionally well is iterative decision making with uncertain and imperfect information. Right? We've the the joke's always been if you want to build the perfect mine, you sort of plan it after you've extracted the ore body. Right? We're always in this business of never knowing exactly what the next piece of information that we need is, and I actually think this is part of what hinders us as we expect to not have the full data set in order to make the next decision. Look, it's also true that we aren't digitally native. As my high school physics teacher said, you know, find an industry where you produce real things. We are at the boundary of where digital and the real world meet. There are, you know, when we talk about an inventory number or we talk about stockpile or the amount of tons in a silo, that's not just a digital number. It actually represents something physical in the real world. And that interface of where the real world and digital meets is often very, very complex. Look, it's also true that we do this in remote operations and that has an impact. Connectivity, latency, mobility, these are all things that are made much harder uh, if you're not running a copper mine in the middle of Salt Lake City. But the truth is, is these barriers are moving away. We're not seeing them as much as we once did. And so what we're actually experiencing is that now we're able to start bringing this technology and these platforms into the mining industry. And the way in which we see that digital is actually impacting operations in reality is really fourfold. And this is where I wanna spend a little bit of time and, and certainly invite your questions. The first is that we'd see that we can increase the efficiency of a process. This is really about saying, well, we know every week we're going to produce a weekly plan or a financial report, or we're going to produce uh, a monthly plan or a quarterly earnings report. And we can do that faster. We can do it in a way that requires less resources. Often this is where we spend a bit of our effort is to make sure that we can improve the efficiency of a process. Perhaps more importantly, what we're really looking at is how do you increase the effectiveness of that process? So we think about that as, Right, I'm going to produce a weekly plan, but how do I improve the outputs? How can I ensure that, that that plan is more achievable, has a better chance of success, or produces a, a better business outcome for the mine? Interestingly, digi digital technologies are also giving us the opportunity to differentiate our product to the customer in ways that maybe we couldn't have imagined a decade ago. It allows for a level of transparency and interaction through the supply chain that we, that potentially allows us to differentiate the way in which our customers interact with us. And the final one is really a step change in capital intensity. This is an area that I think more research is required. It's not one that was well understood, is we understand that we can improve these efficiencies and these processes, that we can increase the amount of data that we're moving, making in the decisions, but it's not yet really clear what that means in terms of our ability to reduce the capital intensity of installing the next level of uh, in, installing, uh, installing capacity to increase tonnage. So what does all this mean? Well, 
what it what it's really doing is it's actually pushing us to where what we're trying to do is bring that iterative decision making with incomplete process along with all the digital with the way in which we're impacting those processes such that when we're when we're working in mining and we're making these complex decisions we use all the data not just what's readily available to us or what we think we know through intuition but we actually have all the data available to us one of the examples that I like to use is that it seems to me that when I was a short term planner, in order to give you some estimate of what the shovel would produce tomorrow, it was the equivalent of saying, well, why don't, if you want to predict how fast Matt will run a 5K tomorrow, go ahead and, and uh, take the average of all the five kilometer runs he's done over the last 10 years and use that for a forward prediction. Now, sure, there's some val validity in that, but the truth is, is that through this little device, you can access my Strava profile. And with that, you know how hard I've been training, whether I've been doing long runs or interval training, what my diet looks like, what my sleep patterns are. And if you're going to make a prediction about what my performance is, would you rather use my average from the last 10 years or all of the data that's available to you that might give you a more accurate prediction of how fast I'll run a 5K tomorrow. The other thing we see is that it's no longer required just to build physics-based models. We can use data and analytics simply to use heuristics and empirical data to link inputs to outputs. And this, this really allows a step change, not just in how we approach problems, but also the people that we engage in those problems. And our team, one of the most fascinating things is the diversity that we bring. We have just a very small team working with the operation out in California. Some have joined, have joined me today. We have people from all walks of life, from all over the world that are working with us in data engineering, data analytics, and building software. And it's really opened up the industry to just about anyone uh, with an aptitude for data, digital, software development, and it allows us to bring all of those people from all walks of life into helping us solve complex problems. The other thing that we see is the real value when we can know everything in real time all the time. So this is fascinating. If you think about what's happening in the mind, most of the time, the process is invisible. And what digital is really allowing us to do is make the invisible visible. We can now share with the entire business that's located around the globe, everything about what's happening with specific orders, with tonnage movements, with equipment, with processing improvements, we can know all of that at the same time. And so we reduce the friction in the business simply because people aren't making decisions off of different data sets. Look, last but certainly not least, we can also track decision making. So, through all this iterative decisions, we're now not just capable of knowing what decision we made when we set out a weekly plan or we decided to make a sale to the customer or we dispatched uh, an, a piece of equipment or changed an instruction to a supervisor, but we actually know all of the data and the full context in which that decision was made. We can capture the time at which it was done and how that would decision was made. And this is critically important as we look at how we want to change the next step in the process. Is it's really important that we understand, well, why is that decision getting made? What's the data that drives that decision? And how could you possibly change it? If you want to improve it, what is the insight? What's the data? What's the information that's going to change that decision that people are making? Look, the other two areas that we're spending, that we certainly spend a bit of time is simulating outcomes and optimizing results. And this is really about how we're using the data in complex algorithms to drive to an optimal result. There's absolutely space for this as we look at digitizing the mining businesses. But what we also know is that if we just focus in those areas and look at the value that it can extract, we actually are missing massive opportunity in the levels above that that we can see significant improvements in the performance of operations if we simply connect people to the data in real time and make sure that they have all of the data available to them. So what does this mean as we think about a mining engineering career? Certainly I never expected that as a 
you know, stepped into a role at a small coal mine in Northwest Colorado uh, 20 years ago that I'd be talking to this fine group about digital and mining. But I think what we'll see is an even greater change as we move forward. I've already touched on this theme that I don't believe anymore that what we're going to be, what, what's going to drive is specialized software. In fact, what we're going to be working on is platforms and products where it's not produced by just a specialized few companies, but rally, rather what really drives performance at mining operations is produced by all. How do you turn everyone in that operation into a technology producer? Where previously any implementation of technology in mining was really about how do I maintain pace at lowest cost? I think what you'll see now is it's all about speed. It's not that cost doesn't matter anymore, but the real win is in speed. How fast can you move from problem to problem? How fast can you in, embed that new technique of decision-making within your operation? Certainly we've seen a, uh, a move, COVID has driven this for sure, where everything used to be physical and at site. Even if you look at just the program that we've been working in in the last two years, so much of our work was done at site. For the last 12 months, none of us have been on site. We've worked entirely remote from the mining operation, making impacts to shift level decisions for 12 months. I absolutely believe we'll continue to see this trend of remote everything. I think one of the more fascinating things is that when I came into the industry, we all worked in structured teams. You were in the engineering team, you built a weekly plan, you got handed off in the production conference room at 10 a.m. and that was the plan for the team the next day. That's not really how we're working anymore where we work now much more with loose collaboration and loose teams that come together just for the purpose of solving a complex problem. Whilst we still have some structured responsibilities, the reality is what we see that creates the greatest, uh, the greatest leaps in performance is when we work together in these loose, loose teams brought together with SMEs focused on a common goal. And that really means that we're no longer expecting leaders to have all the answers. It's not about leaders bringing people together and telling them exactly how they're going to solve the problem, but rather how the leader enables them with an ecosystem with the right tools, the right technology, uh, with the right goals, with the right resources in order to solve the complex problems in the mining operation. And certainly what we're also seeing is that it's no longer just about creating a single plan, but rather how fast you can iterate through scenarios to understand the range of possible outcomes that you're likely to encounter. So I think as we think about the mining engineer moving forward, it really puts a premium on, premium on being able to work across the domain for all the way from operators to senior leaders. We spend as much time on the ground understanding supervisor level decisions, truck driver level decisions, uh, those that are working directly at the coalface and how they're making those decisions as we do talking to our senior executives about the programs, about the, the value the program is delivering. I think one of the most fascinating things is really starting to understand this interplay between how business how decisions get made and the business process. So much of the friction that we see is because the tools that we're given to use, the technology that we're given to use doesn't actually match the business process that we're trying to accomplish. And so we fill the gap with Excel or we bang our head against the desk or we complain about our inability to get the data that we need and we're driven to actually avoid the business process that we're trying that we're trying to implement. So really understanding how by unlocking the technology that's available to us, we can ex execute exactly the business process and make the decisions that we want is key to improving productivity. In addition, we really talk about not just being not just being interested in the code, but also being very data centric. So we don't we, we first try to solve problems with data. Where can we find the data? Is there additional data that can help us understand this or provide insight? And don't just turn to creating data with code first. And the final comment that absolutely matters in digital is that we have to be value focused. In all things, we really need to make sure that what we're, what we're driving at and in the digital technologies that we're bringing to the organization, that we're deriving value from the products that we're creating. Look, I'll, I'll come back here um, to you know, really thinking about, so who's that next person that's going to step in this role? 
will take it so far and will advance digital technologies in mining. But the reality is that somebody will come after me and they'll push this forward. And I think I'd encourage that, that you really lean into this, to the digital opportunities in mining, to not just understand the science, to not just understand the technical details of mining, but to really get interested in sort of the social science behind it. How do people make decisions and why? What happens in complex environments when you have incomplete information? What can you do to change that? It's obviously key to lean into coding, right? We do need to understand the technology. I think that's one of the things I probably neglected in the first 17 years of my career was not spending enough time being mentored by people who understood the, understood the technology better than I did. And finally, I would say in that is that it's absolutely an imperative to be a lifelong learner. We have to accept right now that the technology will change throughout our careers. There's just no chance. So how are you going to avoid being limited by it and rather be able to understand and drive it to increase performance in the mining industry? Thanks very much. I hope uh, that that was of some interest. I'm happy to take questions and, and uh, yeah, let's dive into it. Thanks very much, Lucas. Thank you so much much Matt it was awesome um we already got a couple of questions just before we uh dive into those we got a got a little plug here for mines and uh it's a digital campaign it's called I dig mines so if you're uh if you want to support uh not only mines but also specifically the mining engineering department and help keep those those talks running Luke was going to post post a link for that uh, in the chat but yeah again thanks thanks so much matt i think this gives a really good starting point for some some good questions and um i'm just gonna start out with the first one just going all the way back here um i think the first question was actually coming from ryan and we don't have thousands of questions so ryan if you want to uh, talk to matt directly and unmute yourself we, i think we definitely have time for that i'll ask your question again otherwise i can also do that um it was sort of around uh, what Matt was talking about with the transparency and uh, differentiating the product. And I've been reading a little bit about blockchain being used in the mining industry to be able to, um, you know, for contracts and then also for sort of supply chain, being able to say, okay, this is maybe like example diamonds. These are ethically sourced diamonds, for example, being able to prove that. Um, it was, I don't know if he had some more information on that. I don't know, I was just throwing it out there. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Ryan. It's it's an interesting question, and I, I happen to know there are people on this call smarter than me uh, that could actually talk to the exact way that this is being, uh, that this technology is being applied. Uh, I, I am not at all an expert in blockchain technologies. I know just enough uh, to be dangerous and to use some of the lingo. I think the opportunity, if I sort of stay though at a, at a very high level, because I actually have some questions in this space myself, Ryan, it is not, it is not something I am specifically dealing with, um, is you know, the real concept here is how you create an immutable ledger that provides complete chain of custody for your product. Right. That's um, exactly how that's done and exactly what what prevents you from doing it is is research that I'm interested in learning more about. Um, but it makes sense to me. Right. Exactly. As you say, is that, you know, a, a significant part of the problem that we face in many of our value chains, whether it's in some of our minerals values chains or in our aluminum value chains or, or as you pointed out in the diamonds value chain is, look, we we not all we want to know that as material moves through the supply chain that we can identify its origin and its provenance, right? That, that's of some increasing value as we think about, you know, trends that we're seeing around, um, you know, moving to uh, reducing carbon in the environment, reducing carbon footprints, or whether it's about ethically sourced diamonds. So I do think there's, I do think there's value in this. And I do think it is probably a way that we will look uh, to to differentiate product to customers, but I, I will be honest, if I was to try to give you some insight into what's really preventing that, what are the blockers to it, what's the technology behind it, what developments need to be made, uh, I'd be way too far uh, out of my area of expertise. Happy for others to comment if they want to. Yeah, and before others are commenting, I think that's a great, great if you see that there's people with uh, skills on the call to, to answer that would be awesome, but maybe another shameless plug. Uh, we've got a call coming up on April 21st, actually. Uh, with someone who's really, really all about uh, blockchain and mining, um, the guys from MindSpider, I'm not sure if you heard about them before, but 
um, Volker uh, from Germany is going to be talking at a, an afternoon or pre-morning session, 10 a.m., I think. Um, so like our LinkedIn page. But if there's other, <laughs> people, <laughs> if there's other people on the call, please chime in and uh, tell us more. Otherwise, I would just uh, continue reading another question. Sounds great. Yeah, it doesn't doesn't seem like anyone wants to go all blockchain. So um, there was a question from uh, Swiss Mind Training. Um, someone was asking, and I think it's a it's a previous uh, peer of mine from Germany as well. Um, Where's the question here, um, Matt? Can you give a kind of a flow chart or stepping stones to establish a new digital project at a site? Maybe some rough ideas on what are the crucial steps to to make that transition. What is what are like maybe yep. three, four key key things to consider? Wow, I could probably give a whole presentation just on that question. Um, and let me just start by saying uh, the best way to learn to do it right is by learn is by doing it wrong. And I've found many, many ways to do this wrong. Uh, so, so I've gotten it wrong far more often than I've gotten it right. What I will, what I would say is that we've we've learned a few things that are absolutely an imperative when you're starting a project. And and there is no question. Uh, let me unequivocally say. Uh, that, that absolutely uh, a, a very good indicator of success in any digital project is absolutely how you start. Um, and as, as uh, one of my colleagues on this call is, is prone to saying, two weeks on the whiteboard can save you two weeks of coding. Uh, sorry, two days of, two, two hours on the whiteboard can save you two weeks of coding. So a few things to think about. One is that we start by first asking a series of interrelated questions, uh, it, and it sort of is situation dependent. But the most important thing we start with is, what are the problem? You what is the problem you're trying to solve? What is the decision you're trying to make? What is the objective you want to achieve? If I if I had one thing that I said that I would say, make sure in any digital project you start there, it's it's by starting with one of those three questions, and it is somewhat situation dependent. Uh, I've recently heard that sort of uh, reframed as the question we are trying to answer, which I also think is a brilliant way of sort of starting your thinking. We look, there's a few other steps beyond that. If you can really clearly identify that, what's, what's the problem that you're trying to achieve, the objective that you want, uh, or the decision you're trying to change, then there's a few other steps that depending on different techniques that we've used, and, and it is somewhat situation dependent, we'll look at what data is available. So we do sort of, uh, you know, an exploratory data analytics. You sort of go through, you talk to the SME experts and try to understand, well, what data is available in the business before we launch on this digital project? Can we assure ourselves that there's actually enough data to make a difference? I think that's a really important question. Uh, another step that we'll often go through is we do get, we sort of try to marry up to the workflows. All right, we have some hypotheses now about exactly where does this decision get made? So what meetings, what people, what is the process? Um, how might we introduce some digital technology into that process in order to make a change? So that's, that's another thing that we'll look to define. And then I think once we understand that, then you're really into sort of, you know, building out your work breakdown structure, which is to say, well, okay, I now understand pretty clearly what is the project that, what's, what's the problem that I want to, what's the problem I want to tackle. Um, then you're sort of looking at, right, well, what are the various steps? What are the work packages that I'm going to have to deliver? And then I think a really important one, and, and this one has tripped us up more often than I can think, is that you do have to get, you do have to find the expertise in your business or, or external to your business that actually help you through, think through the solution architecture which is how am I actually gonna structure the work that I wanna do and the digital technologies that are available to me to achieve this outcome? Do I have high confidence I can actually achieve this? Um, and, and look, I think that is absolutely where, you know, a couple of hours spent in design, in design thinking can absolutely make a difference. What might be even more important is uh, the things that we've learned that uh, are not you know, that, that can be useful, but aren't always as critical as you think. Look, user stories are important, um, but I think you can, you can sort of become slave to them as opposed to really using field observation, actually watching people in the field and how they're trying to use your tools. Um, absolutely no need to get hung up on the UI early. Like that, that is absolutely something that we now iterate on. 
Um, and we don't look to do design until we actually have something that we think we can present to the end user. Um, and the, probably the thing goes back to my thing of speed is what we've learned more than anything else is, yep, we want to spend the time to ask all those questions. And then we want to race as fast as possible to getting a bad product in front of really good people. And we tell them that up the front, the first thing that we're going to give you, you're probably going to hate. And that's fine. What we want to see is we want your immediate reaction to it. We want to know where we're right or wrong, and we'll come back to you in 24 hours and give you the next iteration. And I think when we sort of get those things right, uh, those that's that's where we seem to be able to to move at speed with our digital projects. Hopefully, that was a useful answer. I think that covered a lot more than the initial question I was asking for. But yeah, I mean, I already said it. If you want to give another talk, I mean, I can, <laughs> can definitely be down for next fall. Um, we had a question from um, from Sophie, um, kind of angel related. You kind of briefly touched on culture, um, and she was asking, how do you effectively change the culture so it's grown up, um, take up of the digital technologies to avoid them being uh, token tokenistic. Tokenistic. I've never heard of that word before, but can you read that question? So uh, I may, I, I, this is, this is excellent. And thanks again for the question. Cause I, I might get a little bit on a soapbox here. Um, so I find this a really interesting one. And I think that this is one of the emerging themes in the industry. That's really fascinating is the interplay between digital and culture. And I would say my emerging hypothesis is very much uh, that it's 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 very much parallel path, that they are completely intertwined, and you can absolutely shift the culture through digital, not not necessarily the other way around, where we used to sort of think that, oh wow, we have to sh we have to shift the culture in order to adopt digital. Um, actually, it's quite the opposite. So, you know, the the approach that that we're starting to see that really makes a difference is when you when you can put the power in the hands of the end user that when they see that you're actually there solving their problems when they see the immediate changes that they've asked for when they become a technology producer themselves uh, when everyone has access to the same data that absolutely shifts the culture in your organization without question um, and and it's it's actually quite amazing to see because it it's you know we have absolutely seen some of our largest skeptics overnight turn into champions. Um, for so long, we've burdened people with way too much on their plates with clunky service desks um, and IT organizations that aren't really interested in what the what the you know the operators trying to achieve. And when we build a digital organization around them and actually make that not not sort of ancillary to the team, but core to the team, we see a real shift in the way that people experience working in the business. Um, I, had a, I had a recent uh, call with, with uh, one of the guys that's working on our platform in the business and he actually rang me up and he said, Matt, um, I feel like I'm driving a Ferrari. I hope to God you're not gonna take away the keys. Um, one of the pieces of feedback that we got early on uh, from our manager of process engineering was, I don't know what you did for my engineer, but I haven't seen her that engaged in years. So, you know, it's really a story, and this goes back to one of the themes in my presentation, it's really a story about understanding that how you embrace digital in your organization, the ability to achieve that, that true democratization of the technology, it can absolutely shift the culture underneath your feet. Yeah. Great question. Um, I've got a private message here from Pete. Uh, do you want to ask the question yourself, Pete or Carney? Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, trying to find my question here. I had it uh, in there I'm someplace. Sorry, I'm going to read it. You were asking about the, the efficient change. Uh, so what's what's hot? No, actually, that was the last question I marked here. Uh, there we yeah. go. Um, what do you find are the key structural issues that are holding back the speed of kind of various technologies from being productive and as a possible implement implementation? You know, it, it seems that a lot of technologies tend to, you know, nobody wants to be the first one to utilize it. Um, yeah. What do you hear some of the key attributes there? The infrastructural issues that are in yeah. key. 
Pete, it's such a great question. I, I got involved. Uh, this is this is going back a few years, and and I I wish I'll give you my own lived experience. I, I sort of hate kind of kind of hate to answer this one because I'm not sure I have great answers. Um, look, there was there's some companies out of the Northwest in the U.S. that are doing some really really fascinating technology on water quality. Um, you know, really really interesting stuff that creates you know potentially fundamentally differentiating data sets because they're absolutely changing the way we think about analyzing water quality and the speed at which you can get results. Um, you know, potential applications range from environmental engineering to tailings management to even potentially process how we manage, how we manage process, how we manage, say, a concentrator process or, a, um, you know, one of, one of those things in the business. Um, and we took some of this technology. I mean, they're they're clever guys, but you know, you're talking about startups. The technology is not proven. It's used a bit in the industry, but not everywhere. And we we sort of started saying, hey, you know, we took it to a few people who are SMEs in this space. And the biggest structural thing that I see is that it's it's real. You know, you, you think about the mining industry, and, and and our our technical workforces are so strapped. There's just a real difficulty in creating the bandwidth to allow for experimentation. Um, it's never that people weren't interested. It was never that they couldn't see the opportunity. It's that it's really difficult for them to prioritize the work inside of the myriad of activities that they have to do. And, and the only thing that I can see is, you know, potentially we can work smarter as an industry. And I don't have an answer here, but it does feel like, you know, we're, we're still working as an industry where, you know, we haven't sort of adopted that that model where technology development is a responsibility of an industry, but it's still very much the domain of every specific asset. And so, you know, you leave these really innovative technology companies trying to knock on every door and so much of their bandwidth gets caught up with people saying no. Um, and so I think there's some really interesting opportunities in that. It's, it's a sort of a personal hobby of mine, uh, but I haven't come up with anything that, that sort of solved that bandwidth problem where, you know, they're really interested but it's like, where am I going to find the 10 hours a week that I need to actually run this experiment and see if I can help this technology company scale what they're trying to do? Did I answer your question, Pete? I'm, I'm not sure I did. Yeah, it's a pretty broad picture. Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking of it more from a, is it an economic, you know, ROI aspect that, that you find interest of minds more? Um, you know, what's, what's the lead into getting the interest and the attention? But yeah. For sure. Look, for sure, it, it sort of does depend on the audience. Um, you know, if you if you can connect with SMEs, often the technology is the selling point. If you're if you're in with executives, we lead with ROI all the time. Um, you know, the, the question is always, where's the money? Um, show Thank me you. the value. Appreciate yeah. it. Great question. Does that kind of go into your question, Claire? Yeah, I saw that you asked something that is kind of along the same lines. It was kind of along the same lines. I'm going to slightly edit my question just to make it different. Okay. Um, so Matt, you work in software and you were talking about how the iterative development cycle of software is rapid. And that's just kind of how software and digital technology works uh, because the pace of digitization has allowed us to accelerate everything. This kind of contrasts with the traditional idea of like, yes, mining is iterative, but traditional mining iteration is kind of this plodding slow pace um, due to everyone wants more information. And so they wait until they have the largest quantity of information possible and it takes a while. Um, my question for you is how do you as a team leader and a developer navigate and really um, interface between those two paces? Because I would, I would imagine from my, from the point of view of having developed some digital tools for mining myself, that it, you always kind of want it to go faster than people really, again, have the bandwidth to do. And I'm wondering as a developer and a leader, how do you deal with that? Um, look, well, uh, <laughs> those that have worked with me would probably say not well. Um, but the, the, you know, some of it is dogged persistence. Um, you know, I, I don't, uh, I don't know if I have any brilliant answer. Uh, sometimes the answer is just, uh, you know, a absolute dogged persistence. But, but look, I, I do think it goes a little bit back to how we choose to work with the business. Um, I've certainly seen what you've talked about, and and look, sometimes the answer is we just take on too much of the problem too fast. 
And so, you know, the speed at which we can operate and the size of the thing that we're trying to change is just more than what the business can handle. So I do think one of my rules is you got to meet where meet the business where it's at. Your question actually allows me to tell, you know, sort of a recent success story, though, and I think why you can have success in this space. Look, we're working with some supervisors who, you know, this this is an operation that's over 100 years old. We're working with supervisors that have been in the business for decades uh, and have been doing their shift lineouts daily on paper for decades. Um, over the space of about a week, we now have every supervisor doing their shift line out on a web-based platform. Now you ask yourself, well, why is that? How, how can you achieve that sort of a change so rapidly? There's no change management program. We don't have a ton of consultants running around. We never spoke to them about the program. We simply came to them and said, we can solve these problems for you. And there's a couple of things that have that have really driven our ability to get that change in rapidly. One is that we were solving a major problem that they had right at that moment. They needed real-time information to make the best decision of what to do on the shift, and they couldn't do it because they didn't have access to it. We were putting that all in one space so they weren't driving through spreadsheets and emails trying to find where's the information that I need to make my decision. Uh, the second thing is, is that once we put their decisions on the platform for the entire business to see, it was no longer respond. Nobody, uh, they didn't have to call the supervisor anymore to find out the information that they needed. So I think oftentimes, you know, the speed at which we want to move is really driven by how much of a positive impact can you make in the people that you're working with. Um, now, I will share with you that there have been other spaces where it's absolutely been slow because the thing we need to do for the business is actually putting more work on someone's plate. And then we're back to the question that Pete asked about, you know, and that really comes down to a bandwidth problem. And so I do think, you know, one of the things you have to have as a digital team leader, um, you know, as mining engineers are coming into the business, um, it, you, you really have to have a flexibility. You have to have an expectation that, look, I'm gonna have to adapt my approach for the situation that I'm in. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we've learned. We're really cautious about bringing in sort of regimented agile coaches in software development. Um, in our environment, we don't find that that necessarily works particularly well. Um, we know that we have to adapt the approach to meet the business where it's at. Thanks, Claire. Great Thank question. Uh, Carl got uh, got a private message to me. Carl, do you want to ask that? I see you're still around. Yeah, I'll change it up real, real quick, and I'll try to keep it short. Hey, Matt, um, what's the one thing from an end user perspective that you could say that the mind software companies are just not listening to when you try to be a giant killer and displace Excel? Oh, wow. What are they just not hearing from you? Wow, that's that's a great question, Carl. Um, uh, if uh, I'm, I'm not, I know Darren's on the call, but I'm happy for uh, any of my team to jump in if they if they want to offer theirs in the chat box or they can jump out. Um, you know, Carl, I got to share this story. Do you know one of the recent problems that we had with end user adoption uh, was that we hadn't appreciated that they were working off a monitor that was 10 years old and they actually couldn't see the end of the, the edge of the software that had the most important columns. So we bought them 30 inch monitors and all of a sudden they were like, oh my God, we'll use this tool every day. Um, you know, so sometimes it's just the simplest things that sort of blow your mind. Um, uh, what's, what's the number one thing that, that end users are saying? Um, I, 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 I guess Carl, I'll answer it this way and I'll give it some real thought, but it is about the speed of iteration. The real thing that we see that drives adoption is that we're making them a part of the process because we actually know the first thing that we give to them isn't the endpoint. And so, you know, they're then, you know, we're giving a planner a piece of software that we know that's not right, it's not going to work. And then they're working with us so that they get exactly what they need by the time that they're done. Um, and so, you know, it can be the smallest things, changes in colors, where does the save button sit, but it can also be large things. I don't need that piece of information. That's not how actually the business process works. You can bring that tool into this meeting, but that's not actually where the decision gets made. Um, I, I think that, that would be my best answer off the cuff. That's a tough one. I'll, I'll think more about that. Great it was question. A question, man. I appreciate it. Thanks, Cole. Um, in the interest of time, we've got four minutes. Uh, Matt, do you have to rush out or do you have a, maybe a couple more minutes to answer questions? Do you? I, I'm, I'm fine. I'm more than happy to stick okay. around and answer questions. Yeah, I don't uh, want to appreciate interrupt that I'm not the shortest person with my words. 
Yeah, that's that's all cool. I think that's that's the key point here to expand a bit. Um, but just for everyone who's heading out, I see already people are leaving. So thank you so much for joining us today. Matt is going to stick around for a couple more minutes and trying to get through all your questions. Maybe not all of them, but hopefully most of them. Um, thanks and again. Please feel free to reach out to link on LinkedIn. I'm happy to happy to make more connections. It'd be a great opportunity. Perfect. Um, yeah. And again, that was my my last plug for our LinkedIn page. Make sure to follow us again and. Uh, Got some some cool digital topics and non digital topics coming up for our seminar and be happy to see you there. Um, I'm just going to go right with the next question. Um, that's the, the benefit of the webinar option. I think the questions are a bit more structured. I have to keep searching here. Uh, this is true. But thank you so much, Matt. This was excellent. I, Thanks very much. Thanks, Great Sam. to meet you. I actually had another question from uh, Sam Lowen. He's an awesome uh, Minds alone. Um, he was asking for specifically, what do you think uh, schools need to do to kind of go along with those changes you mentioned? What's the curriculum change you would want to see? What, um, yeah, what, what is the school's role in the, the whole digitalization journey here? Look, I, I think that's really hard, and and it's one that I'm I'm really excited to be a part of the discussion. I'm I'm so pleased to be able to join the industry advisory council. Um, uh, with Dr. Enders and, and all the rest of the really smart people that are on that council. Um, look, for me, I, I mean, the school's brilliant be at, at, at sort of establishing that sense of a lifelong learner, right? I think, I think that is the most important thing because the reality is, is that we're, we're never, you know, the technology is changing so fast. I'll give you an example. I've worked very closely with a, a guy who has a postdoc in optimization mathematics uh, in a different country, has his own software company. And he said to me, Matt, the technology is changing so fast, I can't keep up. Um, you know, so that's someone whose business runs off of cloud-based software. And he's saying, look, we, we, we can't change fast enough to keep up with what's being rolled out. So, you know, I think part of it is adopting this mindset that, look, we actually can't, we can't give you technically exactly what you're going to need when you, when you come into in industry. So how do we establish the basic principles, the first principles that you're going to need in order to make sure that you're successful and that you can continue to learn regardless of how the technology changes throughout your career? Um, look, I do think the other thing, interestingly, I mean, look, this is a little bit I'll put in a plug for the for the McBride Honors Program, something I participated in during my time at at uh, at the Colorado School of Mines. But I also think more and more our work as mining engineers is going to be yes, we're going to continue to design pits and we're going to continue to design drifts and adits and tunnels, um, conveyor belts and crushers. But I think we're also designing decision making. And I think making sure that part of the education is the social sciences of actually understanding why do people make irrational decisions? What's the logic behind that? How do you actually influence those decisions? Um, I think that's becoming more and more a core part of what an engineering education has to be because the reality is the work that we're doing technically as engineers is all about providing somebody the information that they need to make a decision. So understanding how the brain works and how people actually go about making those decisions, I think is a core part of being an engineer now. Perfect. Maybe Priscilla's question is kind of geared in the same direction, I would guess. <laughs> you never can tell about me. Hi, Matt. <laughs> hey, Priscilla. <laughs> Thank you very much. I attended a, a webinar um, earlier this week done by the uh, Women in Mining UK, and they had a bunch of investment advisors um, on board, and they are advising about financial investments in the mining industry. And they had a number of very, very good things that were brought up, but one of them was the importance of ESG. Yep. Uh, being, um, becoming increasingly important, even though we don't know exactly what it is, and that it could be something that, uh, that ore metals are, are become branded with. So whether it's a, a branding that results in a higher price or whether it's a, a basis for specification, um, yep. the ESG um, done. And they also brought up the sense that the reporting required for ESG um, really requires something um, that's not at the corporate level. And a lot of ESG and SDG kinds of reporting is at the corporate level, but the data they want is a push down onto the sites. Yep. So it, are you and Rio Tinto thinking about exactly how to handle that? Because it seems like a prime opportunity for, um, for IT to, to come to the, 
to the uh, help of, of companies and minimize the on-site um, workload that's going to be uh, communicated? Uh, Priscilla, it's a great question. Uh, it is something, obviously, that Rio Tinto, ESG, the messaging around ESG, it's something that we're taking extraordinarily seriously uh, and, and you know, a really important part of, of our development going forward. The truth is, is that personally, yes, uh, it is something that, that I'm thinking about um, in, in my role within Rio. I, the way I'm looking at it, Priscilla, today, and so I, I, I'm sort of being careful here because I'm looking at it this way. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be so bold as to say whether or not Rio Tinto is thinking about it this way, but it's, it's, you know, it's a known problem, right? It's something we're all thinking about in the industry. Um, and you're right. I think, look, in much the same way, I do think it goes back to some of the themes in the presentation, right? It's like, how do you know everything in all time in real time, at all the time in real time? Um, how do we make data available to all? And then we sort of talk about transparency of the supply chain. And so I think a lot of the things that we're looking at that are driving productivity um, are also things that are going to be important in that ESG conversation. So how do you actually know your carbon emissions in real time? How do you understand your carbon footprint with every decision that you're making? That's actually a data and analytics problem. And it's, it's, it's at the core of actually the problem that we're, that we're really wrestling with, which is you know, data integration, data modeling, right? You're actually bringing lots of disparate data sources together in a transparent way to try to either make an estimate or make a calculation of those things that are impacting your carbon footprint. Um, I think that's a really interesting complex problem to solve. We've, it's not something that I'm personally taking on at the moment. Uh, but it is it is something that we're absolutely thinking about, and I'm sure that there will be research in is, you know, if we really want to create transparency around what's the carbon footprint in those in those in the metals and minerals that we're producing, it's ultimately going to come down to a, to a data and analytics story. Uh, we're going to see many of the patterns that we've seen they were, already. They were actually casting the whole the whole response to ESG as being um, a an inflection point in the industry. In point of fact, one hundred percent. I agree with that. Huge, and that you cannot run away from it. The stakeholders will be heard. <laughs> and I, but and Priscilla, I think this is an important point. Is that you know you said something interesting there? Is that in in, in um, all the ways that we're approaching this, um, you know, digital is not an IT problem. It's a business problem. And very much what we're doing, well, it is a partnership between IT and the business. So yes, IT has a role to play, but it's actually about, you know, we're, we're, the model in my head is very much that digital is at the table, just like operations maintenance in your technical department. It's simply a, a different set of tools on which we're solving complex problems. And I think as we approach the carbon problem, we'll, we'll, we very much have to think about it the same way. Thank you. Great question. Thanks. I like and, that one. That was fun. Yeah, it's been um, really nice, really good <laughs> by all, all the participants. And just looking at the time, we're five minutes past and we've still have 84 people on board. So <laughs> that's, that's I, really yeah, look, I could probably do one more. I do have to drop off to another meeting um, uh, that someone's pinging me about. But uh, let's take one more and, and then I'll just thank everyone for their participation. Sounds good, Matt. Thanks so much. Um, did you want to, did you get a question personally or you want... Oh, I was trying to read this last one, uh, but I'm not reading fast enough. I'll ask Matt. Matt? Hey, Satish, how are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. Hey, uh, I asked that question. Uh, what we find uh, is that, you know, uh, a lot of the minds seem to be super risk averse in trying to, uh, you know, when you take a new set of technology to them, they seem to be very risk averse in, in trying it out. Yeah. And especially at the large mines, uh, or at least at the large firms, uh, they do, uh, I mean, they seem to have a, you know, not built here kind of mindset, right? So how, uh, how do you... Um, how do you break through that? Exactly. I mean, how do you yeah. do that? I mean, at the small ones, Look, it, hey, it, this is too much for us. At the big ones, it's like, well, I don't know you. Yeah. Look, I, I mean, it goes back a little bit to my question, to the answer that I gave to Pete, right? I do think there's something about how the industry works together and the opportunity to work, to work better as, as a body at, at sort of developing these emerging technologies. 
uh, look, I'm I'm actually a little bit. I don't know that I necessarily see the risk aversion. I mean, look, there is absolutely we've been burned, right? Um, uh, my career is unfortunate, you know, is littered with technology projects that did not return on the investment, um, and so you know that that caution and that questioning really does come from a place of experience. So. You know, I think that's and, and it does go to that point of sort of, uh, you know, a core part of the story has to be a very, very clear value narrative. Uh, but I think, you know, the the other point to that is um, what I said to Pete is that, you know, don't underestimate that sometimes what we see as risk aversion is actually just a lack of bandwidth. Um, and, and so I think part of technology development is also understanding how can we trial these technologies in mining without without sort of the burden that it places on the operator. Um, you know, the, in, you know, unless you look, it's, it's pretty known in the industry, right? Unless you're in iron ore, the margins are thin. Um, it's, there's not a lot of capacity running around the business to, to, to put into, um, large bets that may not pay off. So I do think we have to, we have to work together as an industry to think differently about how we bring technology into the operations. Well, fair enough. I mean, I, th I think Matt mentioned he has to head out, so I don't want to yeah. over, over stress his time. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, you can definitely have the last word here, but thank you so much from our side. We really appreciate your time. It's, it's been awesome. I think those, those uh, interactions between industry and, and school and then also being able to share it with so many people around the globe is just amazing. And you really make, make that happen and, and all the speakers that attend. So thank you so much for yep. that. Thank you. Uh, look, yeah, ab yeah, absolutely thank you, great. And Thanks so much, everybody, for joining. It's um, it's a really fascinating to talk, talk about. I'll just close by saying, uh, you know, this year Rio Tinto will bring on 13 data scientists. They're 50-50 male and female, and they're all from graduate programs. So, you know, you are seeing a watershed change in the industry, um, and it's a great opportunity to just bring really diverse thinking into our business. So, um, you know, I think my closing message would be absolutely lean into this space. It's a target-rich environment. Um, it's a tremendous amount of fun, and we're going to really have an opportunity to transform the industry. Thanks, everyone, for your great questions. Uh, you, you definitely had me on my toes. Look forward to the next time. Thanks very much. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.